Hi everybody, welcome to the middle of nowhere. The PC you see right here cost me just under $1,250 US to build before any taxes or shipping. I purchased the parts as they became available and as for the hardest part to get, the GPU, I signed up for EVGA's waiting list and then waited for about five to six months. The wait was worth it, however, as this let me buy the GPU for MSRP, which is around $399. If you were to try and build this PC right now, you could probably do so for around $1400 to $1500, bucks, again before taxes and shipping. With some minor tweaks, you could also easily gain performance and also save some money. While a lot of people on the YouTubes and various PC-related media have been getting super excited that prices for GPUs are on the decline, which they are, I would still remain optimistically cautious. One, GPUs are still not priced anywhere near MSRP, yet. Two, they still aren't always in stock. Unless you're lucky and live near a micro center, which I'm not, you're stuck with online stores. So finding something in stock and for a decent price is still, in my opinion, a crapshoot. Regardless, it's a new dawn and PC part prices are for the most part trending downwards, but I still recommend you buy your components as you can afford them and as sales occur rather than attempt to buy everything at once. Prices are still fluctuating like crazy, so don't miss out on any deals you come across like I did when Corsair's 275R Airflow went on sale for 58 bucks and now I can't find it anywhere for less than 150. Anyway, let's go over the parts for this sweet PC build and if you're interested in any of them, I've put links to the items I discuss in the description below. Starting with the CPU, I've had this 3600X since last March when I got a 20% coupon for my birthday from Best Buy. Since Ryzen 3600s were pretty scarce at that time and not available for their budget-friendly price of $199, and because 5600Xs weren't any easier to get and also way more expensive, I bought the 3600X for $224, saving roughly $25 in the process. A year later though, I cannot recommend this CPU, mostly because the 5600X's price has reduced to around $228, making it the obvious choice. Bottom line, if you find both CPUs at similar prices, the 5600X is the better deal due to higher instructions per clock, a higher boost clock of 4.6 gigahertz versus 4.4 gigahertz, and a lower TDP of 65 watts versus 95 watts. Having said that, the 3600X is still no slouch, so if you can get it for around $175 or so, then pounce. For this build, I did not use the 3600X's stock CPU cooler. Instead, I'm using id Cooling's SE234 ARGB Tower Cooler. It's very affordable at $39.99, and it comes with an ARGB fan, at, and the top, as you can see here, also lights up by connecting to a header on the fan cable. However, this could be seen as a negative because should the fan fail and you can't replace it, then you can't use ARGB on the cooler either. The tower itself is offset for compatibility with taller RAM modules. There's an included tube of thermal paste, as well as an RGB controller, should your motherboard not have an ARGB 3-pin header. After having put the cooler through its paces while testing, I can say it works very well and keeps the 3600X cool. As the 5600X has a lower TDP compared to the 3600X, I have no doubt the SE234 would have no problems cooling it. For the motherboard, I went with the Asus Rogue Strix B550F Gaming. I lucked out by buying a new one on eBay for $110 or $70 lower than its current list price of $180. If you don't mind taking a chance, then I highly recommend going with a third-party site like eBay, Facebook Marketplace, or OfferUp to save some money. Most are backed with some kind of buyer protection should you have the item shipped. The B550F Gaming boasts a robust rear I.O., a BIOS flashback button on the back, an integrated I.O. shield, two M.2 drive slots with heatsink covers, one of which is PCIe 4.0, a 2.5 gigabit ethernet port, a plethora of internal I.O., and a 12 plus 2 phase power delivery. It's been easy to update and I've had no issues while testing the PC. For more information on the Rogue Strix B550F Gaming, check out my two videos on this motherboard and its BIOS. The RAM I'm using is the tried and true 16 gigabyte kit of G-Skill Ripjaws 5. It's DDR4-3600, Cast and C16. There's no RGB, but this kit is both fast and affordable. If you want to save some money, you can shave off around 20 bucks by going with the CL18 version of this kit. I'm not sure how much performance you'll lose, but if saving money is your goal, that's the recommendation I'd make. There were also zero issues after setting the XMP profile within the BIOS to the rated 3600 speed. I've also had zero issues with this G-Skill kit for the PCs I built using it, and I highly recommend it as an affordable, high-performing option. Storage for this build consists of two drives, a 500GB WD Black NVMe SSD. It's a PCIe 3.0 drive and is Western Digital's first NVMe drive that came out before the SN750. It still performs very well with read speeds of 3400MB per second and write speeds of 2800MB per second. If you want to be current, I recommend going with WD's newer SN750 or have a look at the new SN770, an affordable PCIe 4.0 option. 
Because 500 gigabytes isn't a whole lot of storage, I also added a one terabyte WD Blue 2.5 inch SATA SSD for storage programs and games. It's an affordable drive at $109.99 and has DRAM cache. An alternative one terabyte SATA SSD I can recommend is Crucial's MX500, which hovers around the $90 to $110 mark. The case I went with is the Corsair Carbide 175R. It comes with one RGB fan, which I'm not even using as I'm going with some inexpensive ARGB fans uh, I found, and I'll discuss those in a bit. The case has a heavily tinted tempered glass side panel that uses the old school four thumb screw mounting method, but there are pegs on the glass to hang on to at least. There's a sweet Corsair logo that you can see here at the front that glows from the RGB or ARGB fan light shining through. There are rubber grommets, reusable PCIe slot covers, ample space for cable management at the back, and it's just the right size for the components I chose. I haven't done a full review on this case prior to this build, but I can say it was pretty easy to build in. The bottom hard drive cage is removable, which allowed me to better stow away my power supply cables, and the two 2.5 inch SSD caddies on the back are easy to remove and use. There is no USB type C port in the front, unfortunately, but it does have a power and reset button, two USB 3.2 gen one ports and separate audio and mic jacks. The only glaring negative of this case is the solid front panel, which limits airflow as the only intakes are at the top and bottom of the panel. Luckily, the panel should be easy to mod. And if you mess up, you can buy a spare front panel on the Corsair store. Leave a like and a comment if you'd like to see me rebuy this case, a spare front panel and do a mod to help increase airflow. Because the case only comes with one fan, and from reading user reviews, it's a pretty weak one in terms of the light produced, I decided to buy a three pack of Fantex PH-F120SK 120mm ARGB fans. These are the same fans that come with the P360A. Be sure to check out the review I did for that case if you haven't already. These fans are fairly inexpensive, and the best part is you can daisy chain the ARGB cables and then plug just one ARGB header into your motherboard. Additionally, there's a separate four pin PWM splitter cable you can use to daisy chain the three fans as well. This means you'll only have to use one fan header and one ARGB header when using these fans. The only downside I found with these fans is the absence of instructions on how to properly daisy chain them. But if you're savvy enough, you should be able to figure it out. Since these fans plug into the motherboard, there's no need for a controller or fan hub at the back, like with other similarly priced fans. As for speed and sound, they seem to push quite a lot of air and are fairly quiet. Can't hardly hear them right now. Which is all you can ask for in a budget set of ARGB fans. Powering this computer is the Seasonic S12 III or 3 650 watt 80 plus bronze power supply. It's non-modular unfortunately, but there is zero ketchup and mustard present, something I strive for in every build. There is only one 4 plus 4 CPU power cable, so do be aware of that, but there are two 6 plus 2 GPU cables. According to my PC part picker parts list, this PC build will pull around 394 watts, so there's plenty of headroom for me to upgrade to a more powerful CPU or upgrade the GPU to a 3060 Ti or possibly even a 3070. Having said that, if you were to get a 3070, I recommend a 750 watt or higher PSU so you can maintain better efficiency under load. To add some additional flair to the build, I bought some black and white cable extensions. They break up the monotone black of the build, not counting the ARGB of course. And I think the white brightens up the build a bit. These are the KuCat cable extensions and come in at a very affordable price at $21.99. The cables themselves are thick, somewhat stiff, but very trainable. Installing the combs takes some effort, but not terribly too much. Overall, I think the extensions give some elegance to the build, standard PSU cables just can't. This is also the second PC build I've used KuCat extensions for and I'm as pleased now as I was then. The final piece of this PC is the EVGA RTX 3060 XC gaming GPU. It has a boost clock of 1.78 GHz, 12 GB of GDDR6 VRAM, 3584 CUDA cores, requires only one 8-pin PCIe power connection, and comes with a metal backplate. There is no lighting on the card, so do be aware of that. If you want to show it off, you'll need some lighting strips or bright fans. It doesn't take up a lot of space either, so you can definitely install the GPU into a case much smaller than the 175R. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I lucked out with this GPU by hanging in there on EVGA's waiting list for around six months. My patience paid off, so I was able to buy this GPU at the $399 MSRP. If this is the GPU for you, the only advice I can give is to stay the course and be patient. I believe prices for GPUs will continue to fall as they have been in these past few weeks, especially in the US where the tariffs, which caused some of the price increases, have finally been halted. What do you think of the parts I chose for this PC? What parts would you change and why? 
let me know in the comments down below. Now is the time where I'd normally do a build montage, but unfortunately all my build footage for this PC is extremely noisy, making it largely unusable. I did use some of it in the B-roll when discussing the parts, but by and large, I don't want to subject you to too much of it. I was trying something new using my cell phone camera and a harness to give you a first person point of view of the build process. And while it went fairly well and I have over two hours worth of footage, it's just not a quality I consider good. Instead, I'll just skip to talking about the build process and performance. If, however, you want me to make a video using the footage of the build, let me know in the comments below. If I see a good number of comments asking me to hashtag release the noisy cut, then I'll do it as I haven't chucked the files in the bin yet. Let me just say that building this PC was pretty straightforward and easy, and I'd say the most frustrating parts were plugging in the CPU power cable since I had to route the extension a certain way after plugging it into the motherboard, and the hole for the CPU power cable is a very tight fit for that extension cable, and also close to the motherboard. Luckily, the top fan mounts are offset so as to not impede this cable or the top motherboard headers. I will say though, definitely pre-route cables coming in from the top before you install fans there and possibly even the motherboard. Secondly, the CPU cooler was a bit finicky. The cooler's instructions aren't the best due to the size of the pictures and text, but they're okay enough to get by. Really though, it just comes down to two things with the cooler, the plastic standoffs and then the stupid little metal fan clip used to secure the fan to the cooler, which I do not like at all. However, most budget coolers seem to use this method of fan installation, so it's just a pain I have to live with and not really a deal breaker in any regards. Other than that, figuring out the cable management at the back was a little tricky, not because of the tight spaces or lack of cable tie down points as the 175R has ample space and many tie down points, but because of all the cables present in the system due to the non-modularity of the power supply. Since there's an opening at the front of the basement cover, I had to make sure the cables were sufficiently shoved to the back so it's not be showing when looking at the case from the side. Thankfully, the glass is very tinted and aids in shading any protruding cables, trying to sneak a peek at what's up top. I'd definitely recommend the 175R if it weren't for the front panel. It's inexpensive and has ample space for all your parts. As such, I'll say this. If you buy this case, be adventurous and buy a spare front panel. Then design a fun mod for the front that will increase airflow. Should you screw up? Hey, at least you have a spare panel you can still attach. Installing windows and drivers was a piece of cake. I had zero issues getting everything I needed installed or updated. It just took a bit of time, of course. I also updated the BIOS to the most recent version, as well as the chipset drivers and anything else that needed updating. Setting the XMP, precision boost overdrive, and enabling resizable bar was also quite easy within the BIOS. The only ASUS software I installed was the ASUS Armory Crate plus Aura. Armory is nice and lets me easily update software and drivers for the PC, and lets me adjust the RGB lighting. You can change the fan settings too, but there is no custom curve control that I could find, unfortunately. You'll either have to do that in the BIOS or use ASUS's AI Suite 3, which I didn't install as I find it rather invasive and resource consuming. With regards to temperatures, the system stayed rather cool, and that's despite the terrible front panel design, which I've already talked about at length. While running Cinebench R23 for back-to-back 10-minute -back sessions, the CPU reached 79.4 degrees C with the panel on and 73.3 C with it off. While 6 degrees doesn't seem like a lot, it can mean the difference between thermal throttling or not should the system get extremely toasty. While I ran the benchmarks and gaming tests, the default fan curves kicked in as temps rose, and the fans ramped up becoming noticeably louder, but not so loud as to be annoying or overcome a good pair of headphones. During gaming and benchmark sessions, neither the GPU nor CPU ever got it above 66 degrees Celsius, which is a win in my mind. I think your best bet to keep noise levels down is to set a fan curve in the BIOS for those fans attached to the motherboard, and then download either EVGA's GPU software or MSI Afterburner and set a custom fan curve for your GPU. GPU. Find a good balance between cooling, performance, and noise. When it comes to gaming, this PC can definitely game at 1080p high settings, no doubt. Luckily, I was able to make use of my old 1440p monitor since I replaced it with the Corsair Xenion as my daily driver. If you haven't already, be sure to check out that video as well. Since I was able to test the system at 1440p, I went for it and I was pleasantly surprised. Most reviews I've read for or watched stated the RTX 3060 was a very capable 1080p GPU, but I found in the course of my testing, it could also do well at 1440p, at medium, and even at high settings for some games. All the benchmarks or actual gameplay was very smooth, and I even scored two goals while testing Rocket League, and I suck at that game. 
Cyberpunk, which is a very demanding game, ran smooth at 1440p with DLSS set to performance, both with ray tracing medium settings and with medium settings no ray tracing. I even got into some massive cyber dude on cop combat to see if the game would slow down while being swarmed by the fuzz and bullets flying everywhere. I ran most tests at both 1440p and 1080p to get a good comparison except for Rocket League because I felt if the game ran at an average FPS of 284 in 1440p at highest settings then it would only go up from there at 1080p. And also Cyberpunk 2077 mostly because I just forgot and I felt the two 1440p play sessions performed super well. Anyway, here are my results testing this PC. Oh, and if you're wondering, can this PC hit the magical 60 FPS for Elden Ring? I think it can, even at 1440p, provided you tweak the settings a bit more than I did, as I mostly reached an average of 56 and 58 FPS during combat on a mixture of maximum settings, and slightly less than maximum. As a side note, I'm also terrible at this game. And that's it for the Tinty McTinterson build. Yeah, I know it's a terrible name. But do me a favor, suggest a good name for this build in the comments below. The name I end up choosing will be the one I use for my PC part picker and builds.gg PC build entries. I'll announce the winning name here via pinned comment and also on Twitter, so give me a follow there if you'd like. Overall, this is a good PC and it didn't cost me a kidney to buy and build. And it won't cost you one even now, well maybe just a pinky toe. It was fun to build and easy to set up, and I think it performs very well. Obviously I'd recommend the 5600X over the 3600X considering the current price of the Zen 3 CPU. And the only glaring weak spot is the 175R's front panel, not allowing for enough airflow. However, a Dremel, fine mesh, some glue, and your imagination can easily fix that. I think this PC build is a very viable option at its $1300 to $1500 price point. If you're up to scouring the web for good deals, you can definitely build this PC without breaking your bank. Thanks for watching everybody. Hit that like button if you liked the video or at least found it helpful. Feel free to share any questions or comments you have down below. Show your support for the channel by clicking subscribe and don't forget to click that notification icon so you don't miss out on any future content. And hey, while you're here, check out some of the other videos I've made. I'm Seth and I'll see you next time in the middle of nowhere.